Have you ever gone into a conversation and all of a sudden, right in the middle of the conversation, things just go south? Emotions escalate, people say things that they regret later, people get angry, they rant, they rave. That ever happened to you? How do you feel when that happens? Kind of frustrated. Somebody said, I'm exhausted when that happens. Well, have you ever gone into a conversation and you know going into the conversation that the outcome is going to dramatically impact you in either a very positive way or a negative way? Everybody ever been there? Well, have you ever gone into a conversation and you know right away that that other person's not going to agree with you? You're just butting heads. Well, have you ever been fortunate to have all the stars align and all three of those components come together? If you have, then you have what we call a crucial conversation. Strong emotions, high stakes, and opposing opinions. When crucial conversations happen, we're stuck. We're not getting the results we want. And we don't think it's our fault, and so we tend to do a couple of things. We're stuck. We're not getting results in a variety of areas from failing dysfunctional teams to problems with spouses and teenagers, or could be at work, problems with cost, quality, safety. And when conversations turn crucial, we have three choices. We can either step up and have the conversation go well. We can step up and have it go poorly. Or our third option is what? Yeah, be silent. Just don't hold the conversation. Which one do we typically do? The, the third one. We don't hold the conversation. And we wonder why we get such poor results. And when I ask people, I say, why aren't you holding these conversations? And their typical responses are, well, you know, I just don't want to hurt people's feelings. Or I'm certain that it's going to be, there's a lot of conflict, and I just, I'm conflict adverse. I just don't like the way it feels. And so a lot of times we trade that certainty that it's going to go poorly for bad results. And so we don't do anything and think that the results will change when they won't. I have had a few people who say, Dave, you know, it's not that I don't want to hold the conversation. I really do. I just don't know how to go about it. And so that's why we try and help people through crucial conversations. What happens is that we toggle back and forth between this continuum of silence or violence. And if you look at the very center of that model, you'll see what we call the pool of shared meaning. And the pool of shared meaning is simply the place that dialogue occurs. And dialogue is defined as the free flow of information, of meaning. I'm trying to get my meaning into the pool, and I'm trying to engage you and make you feel safe enough to talk about almost anything at almost any time. Because our research says that if you can make it safe enough for people that they understand that you have your, their best interest at heart and that your motives are right and correct, then they will stay in dialogue with you even when they're hurt and they're frustrated and they're angry. Because our research says that if people don't feel safe, we have two options. We can either go to silence or we can go to violence. Silence is any form of action taken to withhold meaning from the pool. I can play verbal games. I can mask my emotions. When we mask, if you think of a Halloween mask, we're covering our true emotions. Uh, we use sarcasm a lot to mask what we really want to say. Or sometimes we can withdraw. Have you ever been in a meeting and you notice someone is physically there, but they've really physically shut down? They're not contributing to the conversation. They've withdrawn. So that's a form of withdrawal. But I can physically leave the room, or I can also avoid you. I can physically avoid you. I can take a different route down the hall because I want to avoid running into you. Or maybe we talk. We talk about what we did on the weekend. We talk about our families. We talk about sports. But we rarely talk about what it is that we really need to talk about. And why is it that we're not better skilled? Because what people tell me is, oh, I'm very skilled at going to all my coworkers and having that conversation about this person rather than holding it with the person I need to. Because we want to validate our own bad behavior. If we can get somebody to agree with us, then it's not our fault. That person is the villain and we're the victim. But what's interesting is, in that continuum between silence or violence, we toggle back and forth in the same conversation. Think about as a child. How did you get your way? What tactic did you use with your parents or your teachers or siblings to get your way? And I would venture to guess that whatever worked for you as a young child, on some level, is working well for you as an adult. It's 1972, I'm 14 years old, and I'm sitting in the Tennessee Theater in downtown Knoxville, Tennessee, watching what I thought at the time was absolutely the best movie I'd ever seen in my life, and probably going to change my life. The movie was called Billy Jack. 
I don't know if you ever saw it. It was sort of this kung fu meets western. It has an awesome line, awesome. It's when Billy Jack has already taken his socks and shoes off, so you knew things were going to get heated up. And the town bullies are surrounding him. And he looks at the leader and he says, I'm going to take my left foot and whop you up the right side of your head and there's not a thing you can do about it. To a 14-year-old, that is poetry. I love the soundtrack. Had the song, One Tin Soldier. Da, 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 da. Begged my parents, begged them for the soundtrack. Finally, one day, my mom says, I tell you what, I'm going to the store, and I will get you your album. It's 1972. We had albums. So I couldn't concentrate all day long at Northwest Junior High School thinking about getting my Billy Jack album. Finally, school's over. We're standing out on the sidewalk, me and three friends, waiting for my mom to pick us up. Finally, finally, my mom pulls up in the 1972 Lime Green two-door Nova. We all pile in, and what's the first question I ask? Where's my album? And as she pulls away from the curb, she says, I'm sorry, I didn't have a chance to get it. So in my emotionally mature, testosterone-induced 14 years of age, what influence strategy do you think I chose, silence or violence? I chose violence. I can't believe you said you were going to do this. You didn't. I can't believe it. I'm so mad. How could you do this? I didn't care that my friends were in the back. I was in what we call our reptilian brain. My emotions were running high. I didn't care. I just ranted and raved. Well, my mom also had an influence strategy. What do you think she chose, silence or violence? Yeah, she went to silence. She let me rant and rave and just make a complete fool of myself. Well, about halfway home, I realized this isn't working. So I said, all right, I'm going to show you. I'm going to pout. I'm going to sit here in silence and sulk and make you feel as guilty as I feel bad right now. And so she continued to drop my friends off, and we finally pull in the driveway, and she turns the ignition off of the 1972 lime green two-door Nova and reaches underneath the seat and pulls out a bag and hands it to me and says, here's your Billy Jack album. How do you think I felt? I felt about this big. And at what costs? You know, yes, my mom understood that it was the rantings probably of a 14-year-old and just let me go through that. But if we continue to act that way as adults with our coworkers, our peers, our family, our friends, people that we're trying to get better and different results with, then we're going to get very, very poor results in the end. And what happens during a crucial conversation, there are three heart problems. Three things occur, and they all affect our heart. First thing is that we are blind to our own role in the problem. I didn't understand that my behavior was my accountability, that I was responsible for it. I was blaming my mom. Secondly, our motives degrade. And what we found is that the first thing that degrades in a crucial conversation is not our behaviors. Those come second. It's our motive. Once my motive changed, my behaviors kicked in, and they changed, and I got very poor results. And then finally, we see that we only have two choices. We can either go to violence or we can go to silence. I tried both, and neither one of them got me the results that I was after. So what we need to do at this point is work on me first. And why would we want to do that? Well, we know us. We have access to us, and we can change us. And what's so interesting about some of these skills is it allows us to take accountability for our own behavior. And when we take responsibility for our own behavior, something very interesting happens. We take control of our lives. And so when a conversation turns crucial and you find you're in that reptilian brain, if you can ask yourself a puzzling, challenging question, blood is redirected to the brain and you're thinking more logically. If you can stop at any point and catch yourself and say, what am I acting like I want? Am I acting like I want to punish? I want to blame? I want to win? And then catch yourself and say, what is it that I really want for myself, for the other person, for the relationship? And if you can determine that, then ask yourself, how would I act if that's what I really wanted? And then behave as if you did. Several years ago, I was working as vice president of learning and organization development for a large healthcare firm. And we decided to roll this out across all 9,500 employees. Well, I knew that I had to get other facilitators trained in this course, and I sent one of my trainers, Judy, off to the four-day training course. Judy came back, and we sat down and had a discussion about what did we need to do to make her successful to start facilitating this course. And we agreed that for the first two full courses, two two-day courses, four days, that we would co-facilitate and alternate the principles. And this would allow her, with me in the room, to get experience practicing before she actually had to facilitate it on her own. But Judy was very diligent in practicing. She would go back to one of our training rooms and practice like crazy. Well, one day she came to me and she said, Dave, I'm going to be back in classroom D this afternoon practicing. 
do you mind coming back there, watching me, and giving me some feedback? I said, no, I'd love to do that. Glad to help. So I go back, and I'm sitting about right here, and there was a particular slide that you could pull down that talked about the reptilian brain and how when a where uh, our emotions kick in and lead us astray, blood is redirected to our large muscle groups, and our processes, at least the higher reasoning center, is redirected to the amygdala, and that's why we sort of behave like an idiot. I thought it was fascinating. Well, Judy skipped that slide, and I stopped her and I said, Judy, you forgot to pull down that slide. Well, Judy came from 20 years in the lab at a hospital before she started working in a training department. She said, I know, Dave, but I think most of these people are clinical. They're going to know what, uh, what, what it is already. I said, really? Because when I went through the training, I just thought that was so fascinating. Are you sure you don't want to use it? No, Dave, I really don't think that they... Uh, really? Because I just... What had happened? What was my motive going in to the conversation? I wanted to help her. I wanted to coach. I wanted to make her successful. What did my motive become? I wanted her to use that slide. I wanted to, I wanted to win. And at one point, she turns to me and she said, Dave, I think you're trying to make me into another you. Well, there's the start of a crucial conversation. And I said, what is it that I'm acting like I want? I'm acting like I wanted to to use the slide. What do I want? What do I want for myself, for her, for this relationship? I want her to be successful. Yeah, that's what I want. And I said, Judy, I'm sorry. I've done it again. I know it sounds like we're arguing. That's not what I want. I want you to take this. I want you to run with it. I want you to own this program. And you know what? If you decide not to use that slide, I'm fine. I want you to own this program. So we talked a little more, went on our our way. About a year later, for some reason, we revisited this case, and we're talking about this story, and she said, Dave, I never told you this, but I always use that slide. You know what's so interesting is that when we stop trying to convince, we become so much more convincing. So if we can learn to ask ourselves in the middle of a crucial conversation, what am I acting like I want? What is it that I really want for myself, for this other person, and for this relationship? And then act that way. Your results are not only going to be positive for you, but for the other person and for your organization. Thank you so much. 